After hearing all this talk of a title, Mikel Arteta instructs his team to lose to keep everybody's feet on the ground. This is the Arsenal Vision post-match podcast. My name is Elliot Smith, the Black Man Twitter, Yankee Gunner. Yeah, I mean, look, you got to understand that all this title talk, I mean, it can get to your head. And so you need that setback to reset, to refresh, to reassess. And uh, that's what we got. In fact, reset is the word that Mikel Arteta used. He said we need uh, a reset. He said a lot of interesting things, actually, following the 2-0 loss to PSV that we'll be discussing today. It's not the only thing we'll be discussing today. We'll be looking ahead to Forest and sort of the state of play generally. And I think the the subject matter today is, should we worry? Should we worry? You know, Leeds, some issues. We saw something that said, oh, that doesn't look like the Arsenal we've seen this season. And then Southampton, second half, saw a few things. PSV in this game, maybe a few more things. And so the question is, should we worry? Well, my guess is we shouldn't worry too much. But as you know, my friends call me whiskers because I worry. And so I think worrying is certainly something we can participate in at least a little bit today. I do want to say quickly that I, I hope everybody uh, recovers okay from the knife attack in Italy. Obviously, Pablo Marie was sent to hospital. It sounds like he's going to be okay. I think one person did lose their life. So a terrible tragedy there. We send our best to uh, Loney, Pablo Marie, and to everybody. Not just Pablo Marie, but everybody involved in that attack and wish them well. Um, Mikel was asked about it after the game. He said, it sounds like he's okay. So uh, fingers crossed there. Obviously, this is going to be a, a podcast where I think we, we try to dissect the, the game against PSV as accurately as we can and, and, and maybe for the first time have a little meat on the bone of things that we can be a little bit critical of. And sometimes that's okay. It gives you a chance to get a new angle on what's going on uh, with the club as opposed to just, hey, we won again. Isn't it great? Yep, it's great. All right, talk to you next time. So let's see how that goes. Along with me to do that now is Tim. You can find him on Twitter at Stoberto. Hello, Tim. Hello there. And Clive. You can find him on Twitter at Clive PFC. Hello, Clive. Hello, hello. I have to say, Clive, like the scathing diatribe you went on in the instant reaction, just going after the players, demanding that we do two stock fallings, no stock risings, the, the vitriol that you spewed, like – I can be critical, but even I found myself wanting to defend the club. So I want to say, I don't know where you found that energy from. I, I hope you've gotten your, your emotions in check for today's episode. Yeah, there's a few things that have been hanging hanging around latent in my brain. And I think there's a moment for it to come mm. out. And uh, last night was I'm, the start of it. I'm excited. What today? See if Tim can get me wound up. <laughs> Look, let's get you wound up. Let's see if we can bring out... Bring out uh, Angry Clive. We haven't had that in a while. It'll be fun. Uh, Tim, so, so let me ask you, just from a very high level, let's start at a high level. We can get granular. But should we worry? Should we worry? The, the, the Leeds game, some things we didn't like. The Southampton second half, if I said, you know, not great. This is a weird game to me because in a way, if we just do some of the simple things, we maybe actually blow them away. Should point out for anyone who cares about the data on XG, 1.5 to 1 in favor of Arsenal, 15 shots to 8 in favor of Arsenal, 70% possession. So there are still things here that look like Arsenal, but I think there's a few things that don't look like Arsenal that Mikel, in fact, talked about. One thing is just he said we didn't compete, and I definitely think the way we approach the duels, the way we approach just the the seriousness of of what's required to play our football maybe wasn't there. So should we worry at a high level, are you seeing enough over the last couple of games that you have concerns? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think they were there from the Leeds game. You know my position on the Leeds game. I didn't mm -hmm. really buy into the, oh, winning, you know, winning and winning playing bad. Winning great. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I just thought we were lucky in that game. Do, do you I, think, I think we did it, was... it in, in honor of Unai Emery coming back to the Premier League because he did it <laughs> 27 times in a row or whatever it was? <laughs> yeah. Maybe a little bit. And I, and I think we were a little bit unlucky to draw against Southampton. I do think we deserve to win that game, albeit mm -hmm. not convincingly. Um, but it's so it's, it's because obviously this game in isolation, I'm not too worried, not too worried about the result. I think what we've done in the Europa League so far is we've given ourselves the right to lose this game. If that makes sense, we protected mm -hmm. the players I wanted us to protect in this game. So Saka, Jesus, Party, those are the three players we really, really can't replace, I don't think. And none of them started. Um, which, you know, which was good. And my attitude going into this game, I think, was probably the same as Arteta's, which was, let's just see if we can get it done, get it over the line. Let's see if we can just nick a draw here, maybe like a narrow victory and get out of here and get the group done. We couldn't do that. We've got, you know, that if, if I told you at the beginning of this group we were going to lose one game, you'd put your house on it being PSV away. It was the only game in the group where you think, we could lose that one 
and now we've got Zurich at home. And yet we're all a bit disappointed because we wanted this put to bed. We wanted the under 12s out against Zurich. That <laughs> might not happen now. Um, I, so, I'm, I'm going to love you. I don't think the under 12s were going to play that game. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, that, that's obviously a little bit disappointing. But over the course of this month, and, and this is where, like, your level of worry, um, you know, depends on you. I came into this month thinking nine games in a month. That is, That hasn't happened since, like, the 1950s. And let me tell you, I've looked at what happened in the 1950s with fixtures when teams used to play on Christmas Day and Boxing Day. And what mm-hmm. used to happen was there was no undersoil heating, so nothing got played in January. It all got called off. You played it all in April, and you played four games in a week. Like, th- th- this hasn't happened in about 70 years, nearly. And so that, that tells you what type of schedule we're dealing with. And you look at our squad at the moment with the three injuries we're carrying, we're probably a squad of about 15 or 16 in reality at the moment. So I came into this month thinking there is not a chance that there is not a dip at some point during this month. Not a chance, absolutely no chance. So my, my expectations for this month were that this was going to happen and we were going to just have to try and get away with some results and we might we might not get away with one somewhere if there was one we were not going to get away with i'd have chosen psv away given the the work we've done in the other games and um and so you can kind of see what's happening here i do think it's largely fatigue based and and obviously that's not an issue that's really going to go away the the issue for me I was kind of expecting, you know, you look at that run of games, Southampton, like Leeds away, Southampton away, PSV away, Bodo Glimt away, like a lot of away games in here. And to me, there just was not a chance that we weren't going to experience a dip at some point. For Mm -hmm. me, what's important is the reaction now, because I think really we do have to take a chance against Zurich and rotate like we just do. Again, like I said last week, we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Just like... Put those guys on the bench again, Saka, Jesus. And if you're in trouble with half an hour to go, fine, put them on. But otherwise, don't bother. You've got to take a chance and mm. be fresh for those Chelsea and Wolves games. And so at the moment, I'm not overly worried because I think there's a chance that Arsenal looked at this spell of games and thought there is risk ba- baked into this somewhere. And they decided, let's get the Europa League uh, group done early so that we can, you know, basically, where are we going to have our dip? Are we going to have it for Southampton and Leeds away, or are we going to have it for Chelsea and Wolves away? That's, I think, and and for me, 100% unavoidable to not have it at all. I think there was no way of managing this month at all without having it. And so at the moment... Can I ask you something about that, though? Yeah, sure. Do you think one option for managing that might have been to play a little riskier with the Europa League and, and use fringier players? I mean, are, do you buy into the well, idea that, that we've, we've sort of been hand-waving using first-team players in midweek and saying, yeah, you know so, what, it keeps them fresh? Do, are you rethinking that at all? No, well, it, it's on the table, but for me, that's just putting the risk somewhere else. And that risk is then that PSV right. away becomes a must-win or a must-not-lose. Right, what if you drop done, points at Boda or, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. What we've done yep. is we've transferred the risk to another game. So, so yeah, that's on the table. But I think Clive made the point well in the instant reaction. Like, who do you play? Like, we've got about 16 players. We haven't got 22. We can't right. rotate all 11 players without, like, getting the under-12s involved, basically. That's just where we are. Like, those Smith-Rowe and Elneny injuries have hit us, as has the Zinchenko one. That said, three injuries is not absolutely horrible that's that's about the going rate so i'm I'm not sitting here like cursing our awful luck and we could <laughs> have lost more key players it's just we could have done with those players so for me it's about how we respond to this now because to me this is a different block of games right. forest forest is not going to be easy they are They've gone right back to basics. They are not conceding goals at the moment. They've gone four five one. They are going to be a pain in the arse. Do not expect yep. if you go into Sunday expecting an easy game or a three nil win, I promise you you'll be disappointed. That's going to be hard. I think we'll win it one nil. And when the final whistle goes, we'll all go, thank fuck that's over. But we have to get that done. Zurich, we have to rotate, and then it's Chelsea Wolves. That this to me is just like another block of games now. 
And a bit like Arteta said, he was talking about reset. To me, it's about the reaction. I'm okay with what's happened to this point because I expected it, but it's about how we manage this this upcoming block of games that will classify. It, it, it's right to be worried, definitely. Um, but at the same time, like we'll find out in the next week and a half um, whether those worries are, are justified or not. Yeah, and look, I, I take your point. The Forest is not an easy game. I'll disagree with it only in the sense that there are no easy games in the Premier League. Like, that's just not the league we're in anymore. Wolves and Forest are two of the worst teams in it. We have to win those games. Like, so, it, you know you know what I mean? What, we, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I'd say is two weeks ago, we'd have smashed Forest. I see e- even mean. playing like this. They're a mm-hmm. very different team. They've changed the formation. They're more settled. They're not conceding goals. They've conceded yeah. four goals in their last five games. It's not the Forest of September anymore so yeah if we'd played them two weeks ago with you we'd have smashed them i i, I promise you it's not going to be like that on sunday it's going to be hard work no that that's that's a really fair point and and by the way i wasn't saying to you no no it actually should be easy like i'm not i'm not necessarily disagreeing with your point but i'm saying from the next three wolves we and have to win Forest, yeah th- those have yeah. to be wins For, firstly just to obviously keep our position and also because you really don't want to go into that World Cup break on the back of what feels like a bit of a collapse is too strong a word, right? But but a decline in performances and decline in aspirations and suddenly you come out of the World Cup break really in a battle for top four. I don't think that's where you want to be. And as long as we beat Wolves and Forest, I think we're going to be in a very, very good position in the table going into that World Cup break, regardless of what happens in the Chelsea match. And oh, by the way, Chelsea aren't great. It's not like we can't beat beat them. But, you know, you win the other two, you're going to be in good position regardless. And, Clive, coming off of this game, like the thing that I think really stood out to me in some of the reaction I've seen, uh, I know Andrew talked about it uh, in the pod and, and on his blog, but Mikel talked about it. We didn't compete. The way we, we didn't really win the duels, contest the, the battles on the pitch that you have to win to play our kind of football, when you want to press, when you want to be um, as protagonistic as we are in our football, when you want to be up the pitch. We, you know, the field tilt chart is funny in this one. It's all Arsenal the entire game. And yet it felt like we weren't playing our best and like PSV had us. And I think it's not because they had all the ball. They had 30% possession. It's not because they had all the chances. They had half the chances we had. It's because we really weren't competing in the duels in the way we needed to in the critical moments. Football is really about the high leverage moments. Everything else is sort of sterile in a football match. And in the high leverage moments, they really outcompeted us. So do do you think that there was an issue with, with effort or intensity? I mean, you would think that when you bring in players that want to show they can be on the pitch for the first team, you know, in the Premier League, like Sammy Lakanga and Eddie Nketiah and Rob Holding, that those players are going to be playing at 110 miles an hour, 110%, to show that they that they can be chosen at the weekend. Do you have a concern that, that we didn't see that? Uh, yes. Um, I have a concern about how the layer below the layer is, is playing. Um, they're playing almost as part of the group, and I think our expectations is we want to be more than the group. You know, and... The first group is carrying the club very, very nicely, thanks, up to the point where our expectations have changed. If we're not top before the World Cup, we'd be disappointed. Well, the group of players that have been Mm. carrying the club, the 14, 15 or so, have raised those expectations, and now we've we've changed them, right? So for me, we're in a top four battle with a potential to do more if we supplement the group appropriately and get a bit of luck with injury for for other teams, right? So... So for me, I'm a little bit disappointed in a, in a couple of the players that um, just seem to be fitting the group and, and just jogging with the group. And it disappoints me. I, I want them to compete for their shirt. And they just seem to be just playing. And I want a little bit more. The way we approach the game, mm. it just seemed to tell me we just we just tried to nick it. We just tried to jog through it. We didn't have to win it. We try to do it, expend as little energy as possible while controlling the football. And then we couldn't control the football because we played on a pudding pitch that fell off, away from your feet. It took away our flow. <laughs> and I, I said, I said, you know, something that's really hit me the last few games, that when our flow is interrupted, we 
we don't look very good. When our flow is good, we look really good. I mean, exceptionally good. You know, as good as anything in the league. But the way the referee slowed the game down, certainly in the interaction yesterday, the way the referee slowed the Southampton game down, it affected us. You know, all the restarts, all the fact he wants to chat to everybody when he wants when they make a foul. If you compare the way Michael Oliver and referee, I think Liverpool game or the Spurs game, I'm not sure which one it was. If you watch how quickly players were allowed to put the ball down and get going again, even though it hurt us, even though we we didn't want them to have the ball, that's the right way to manage a game of football. It's an entertainment thing, right? So Rob Jones didn't do that, and that cost us. That cost our rhythm. We ended up, you know, blowing the game, right? So that cost us points, for I'm concerned. But in this game, I felt the inaccuracy and sloppiness of our basic skills and fundamentals weren't great and so we kept playing a, although we controlled it we didn't control it with any rhythm any flow any waves of attack so we just couldn't quite get the number of passes we needed around the areas that really matter with the accuracy and control that we re- we got used to we didn't have enough of that and of course we developed into this um what really works for us let's be honest right we got three dribbling forwards up front that really can turn, twist, control, protect, drive, slash into areas. And they work as a, as a union. Odegaard mm. just prompts them from behind. When that's all singing and dancing, we look great. Right? So, but to do that, you need to have your mindset dead on. Right? So, and you really do need to sprint to your extremities of your physicality. And was there anything about this game that said to you, this lot are at the extremities of the physicality? No way. And I started to sit there and watch it. I thought, actually, the European games, I don't know if, they are quite slow. W- would you agree on that? That we don't get to We've our... been managing them, to be polite, yeah. right? Like, we've been managing our way through most of these games. I don't think we've given 100% in any of our, our Europa League games so far. No, they are quite slow. And, I'm, and I, I sit there thinking, think, why are we so slow? And we really focus on control, control, control. Okay, the prize, if you... Mm. You, you haven't got too many chances if you mess up two or three European games, you're done, right? So, so there's a different structure right, yep. to them. There's a different risk profile to them. They are slower. I went to the game last week, and I sat there thinking, why am I, why am I falling asleep? Why are the players falling asleep? And I think sometimes, you know, you know, you can be lulled into sleep almost because it's all a little bit easy ozy. And I think we need the contest. I think we need the duel. The contrast between PSV at home and Spurs and Liverpool was just massive, massive. And why was that? The league games that we play, they're like battles, mate. And we missed the battle to get us mm-hmm. going. And I think we were lulled to sleep. And um, there were obviously a quality issues earlier, but I'll leave them for later, mate. And hopefully you'll come back to me. Because I've got things to say about a couple. Oh, of course. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, Tim and I are going to do about 45, 50 minutes on the individual performances, and then you'll, you'll have two minutes at the end to say goodbye. So That's we'll, all we'll I definitely need. Get you, I That's promise. all I need. No, I'm kidding. Thank um, you, mate. It'll, it'll be like three minutes. Um, <laughs> Tim, I, you know that I have a bit of a fetish for attacking football. And so when I'm critical of Arsenal – my eye tends to turn towards what we're doing in the attacking end. Now you can say, well, we conceded two goals. We had others that were ruled out. Our defending wasn't great. I get it. But I still look at this game and I say 15 to 8 on shots, 70% to 30% on possession, and 1.5 to 1 XG. It's another game where I don't think we did what we needed to in the final third. Southampton, if we do what we need to do in the final third, we blow them out in the first half. Second half isn't an issue. Um, PSV, the first game, we absolutely monstered them. And I think, what did we get? A 1-0 win, right? So, I mean, it, it is starting. If, if there is a cause to worry, my worry is going to go where it always is, which is, do we have the goals in this team? Do we have the execution in this team in the attacking third to take advantage of the positions we create? And I think the, that's going to naturally lead to some focus on Eddie and Kedia. I don't want to make it sound like it's just Eddie and Kedia's issue, though, because it wasn't Eddie and Kedia missing chances against Southampton. But... Every team that wants to achieve anything big in football needs to have someone off the bench who can come in and get them goals. Last season, one of the reasons you know we made a push for top four at all is what Emil Smith-Rowe gave us off the bench in terms of his goal contribution. We're not getting that right now. And, you know, Enkedia got a, 
a big contract. And this is not a kick in Kedia's section. That's not my point. It's that we need that person who, when it's not Jesus or Martinelli or Saka, they're coming in, they're getting goals, especially when those three aren't necessarily finishing the chances at their top rate right now. We need to have that confidence to say, you know what, Gabriel Jesus, you've been in the wars. Forrest at home, Eddie's going to go get get his brace. So as you look at what's gone on the last few games, especially against PSV, are you <clears throat> are you concerned? That's a leading question. Let me just say, what, what's your analysis of maybe the drying up of our, our goal scoring a little bit in light of the chances we do create? Yeah, I'm glad you asked me this because I thought uh, the conversation you had about Enketio and the instant reaction was uh, was very thought provoking. I come at it. I, I didn't necessarily massively disagree with what either of you said about it's for um, the best. You know, <laughs> what, about like uh, Eddie not bringing it or whatever. I, I view it slightly differently. I kind of think when all of those backup players that have come in, like Vieira, Enketio, Sambi, none of them are really impressing. Like, there's a reason for that that I think is independent of them as individuals. Like, Fabio Vieira, when we smashed Brentford 3 0 and we were knocking it around uh, and we were looked brilliant, and Gabriel Jesus was all over them, and Saka had their left back on toast and, and all of that. Like, Fabio Vieira looked very good in that team to me that day, and he pings mm. one in off the post from 30 yards. Um, this is different, though. Not only are we not playing as well, but it's a very disjointed team. I think mm. if you drop one of those players into the overall team, but maybe less so Sambi. I think there's more of a conversation around Sambi. I'm sure we'll have that in this podcast as well. Mm. I think if, like, let's say Jesus missed one of the games in September or something, I think if you drop Nketiah into that team, I think he's fine, basically. I think... Um, I think he's kind of fine in this game, a bit six out of ten. But the ball's not really getting into the final third that much. Like they're not good kind of chances. And look, he has his responsibility in that. And I don't, nor do I think he is doing this. But it's not just for him to stand in the eighteen-yard box and say "gimme, gimme, gimme." But I don't think yeah. he was doing that. I do think he was working hard. Maybe not having quite the right impact. I think. Again, as Clive said in the instant reaction, his touch is a bit heavy at times. He got away with that quite a few times. I think in a Champions League game, some of those touches, the ball's gone, um, quite frankly. Mm. But I do think it's difficult when you're in and out. And when you're in, you're in like the B team. And you've got only one of... like We've been rotating Saka Martinelli so that one of them mm -hmm. plays. Like I feel like some of these... like. B players as it were I think it's much fairer to judge them when you drop them into the team like if Eddie started on Sunday which I don't think will happen but let's say he started on Sunday absolutely judge him on that judge him when he's got Saka Martinelli and Erdgaard um, around him and, and party starting and and all of that I, I do think it's difficult for some of these guys to come into some of these games where it's a mix and match team and the guys who are starting let's be honest are playing at about 70 percent and I think that's justifiable but we haven't seen the real Martinelli in the Europa League I think we've really seen the real Gabriel Jesus maybe that one assist against Bodo Glimt because let's yeah. be honest that they're managing it, right? They're trying to win this group at 70%, which I think is the right thing to do. I agree with I that. Think, yeah. I think you drop Eddie into the team on Sunday or against Chelsea or against Wolves or whatever. I think that's when you really judge. And the same with Fabio Vieira um, as well. So I, I do think it's tough for some of these guys. However, so those are the four, like I think Vieira and Nketiah had very similar performances and it's very similar reasons. I think at the back end of the team, um, maybe there are a couple of players who yeah. you kind of think, not, not Time's sure, sure you've yeah. got it. Yeah, yeah, and, and we're going we're gonna to work our way back there. I think part of the reason I'm, I'm more interested in what's happening up front also is I think we have a fairly settled group of defenders that we trust um, and we'll, the best will in the world to Rob Holding, who's a, a lovely guy and been a, a great part of the squad for a long time. There's not a lot of scenarios where he's going to be starting Premier League games, in my view. I think that Saliba, Gabriel, Tomiyasu are all ahead of him as a center back, so he's really fourth choice. We'll get on to him, but I think, you know, fourth choice center back is, you know, you're, you're not going to have four Salibas, I guess is the way I would put it. Um, but it is up front where... You know, I, I think we, we opted not to get that extra player in the summer. We dominate the ball now. We dominate the possession in the final third. 
And when you do that, that has to translate into goals. When you're far up the pitch, like the funny thing is what was working so well earlier this season is what we were saying, right? When you give up that stupid goal, but you're up 2-0 or you're up 3-0, you still win the game comfortably. When you batter the opposition, even if you make a mistake at the back, you still win comfortably. But if you're not turning that possession and turning that field tilt and turning those chances into goals, <laughs> then the whole thing is a house of cards. And Clive, I, I, I do look at it as a situation right now where we have Bukayo Saka, who's doing a great job, young. He's not a 15, 16 goal scorer in the league yet. Martinelli, same thing. Doing a great job. Looks like a star in the making at his age. Is it fair to expect 15, 16 goals? You know, most people would say 10, 11 is a good return. Gabriel Jesus, is he ready to be an 18, 20 goal guy? We think he might be. He's never been. Can he be? Eddie and Kedia, can he give us eight goals off the bench? You know, we we need to know where these things are coming from. And in the last few games, I think just the, the first shadow of a concern about where they're all going to come from is happening for me. So, this was a game that I look at and I say there were openings in the final third. The spaces were there. I don't think we executed well. And yes, you need to fight harder in the duels. And yes, you need to defend better in certain situations. But if we start executing in the final third, that Southampton game turns into a win. This game turns into a win. What do you, If you were Mikel Arteta right now and you're looking at consecutive games where we haven't converted good attacking possession into goals... What would you be thinking of changing, if anything, or what needs to change to get the goal scoring going, get these guys back on the score sheet? So I'll take it slightly upward, if you don't mind, Elliot. I think yeah, please. what's changed this season, right? So we now have five substitutes. That means we can change literally half the team. And what we don't yeah. have, for me, off the, off the bench, is gears. So we have a really intense, agile uh, first group that we all love. Right? That front mm -hmm. four is beautiful. You can add Vieira in there to layer on Tim's point. If you put Vieira behind those three top boys when they're fit and fresh, we will hardly notice the beat slip. Right? The kid's got talent. He's just learning how to play in our league and play at the level that we need him to play consistently. And I thought he did better last night mm. than um, he did last week Thursday, by the way. So, um, so we need gears. Yeah, he was good. So... And when I look at it, we we didn't get the wide man, right? We lost Smith Rowe. Smith Rowe was always a debate whether he's an interior or an exterior player. For me, I'd like him right now <laughs> on the on the left, so I can do yeah. I can put that debate yeah. to one side because I miss him, right? So, but you know, if he comes on the left, he brings a level of gears, security, creativity, shots, uh, final pass. We miss that player, right? Ten eleven goals last season, we miss him. But when I look at Eddie, I'm not seeing the gears. I'm not seeing the gears. So mm. straight away, I've got the ump. I'm not seeing the gears. You've got to bring gears to this group. <laughs> when I was, you know, when I first liked Cody Gakpo, one of the things that turned me away from him slightly was not that he's not a good player, because he's a good player. When I first liked his 20 million euros, now it's, I don't know what the price is. When I looked at him, I didn't really like his intensity and, and these gears. I, I thought he was a big, strong athlete that could power through the middle, more centre forward than a left wing and when he's in the centre forward areas, I think he looks very, very slick. The, the finish for the offside goal was really, really good. So he's a good box presence. And mm -hmm. He's a good physical presence. But I didn't think he brought enough intensity. You know what I mean by that? Constant intensity and yeah. gears. But it depends what you want. You know, do you want someone to be the, the second centre forward? Because if he's the second centre forward, he's a good player. So I moved away from him in my analysis and thought, we need more intensity, we need more speed. We need to keep the dynamics of the team the same. We could make two or three attacking substitutes and lift the intensity. So you almost got to beat us twice. You never beat us because we come in again. At the moment, when we look to the bench, there's no speed. There's no intensity. There's no mm. gears. So if you're thinking about the evolution of this group, we need to think about that when we make our next signings. There needs to be pace, intensity, agility. That's the key thing. So we can keep the pressing going. We can keep people going backwards. We can threaten them on their shoulders if we're one little up. We can do things. And what I'm seeing is Eddie is somebody at the moment who's trying to be Jesus. And fine player, Eddie. Fine player. But I need a bit more for you mm. now because this you need to help carry these boys now. You can't come on and do what they do. You've got to do more than what they do, and you have to execute. And that is the nature of fan expectations and the nature of the fact that you spent a bit more time sitting on your ass. You've got to bring the freshness. You can't bring the tiredness. 
You can't bring the jogging. You can't <laughs> bring what they're... They've got an excuse. You haven't got the same excuses. Yeah. You can't say you're not getting starts because you started every Europa League game. You have played your Premier League minutes. And so my tolerance is slightly less. And so I, oh, it's no problem. I just go, okay, what do we need to do then? You know, are we going to get to promised land with this? And I don't think we are. And it's not a problem right now because we're sitting top of the league and everything that we're doing. But ask yourself the question, is this enough firepower in the group? And my answer is no. It's not enough. And no, it isn't. we can't expect two 21-year-olds to keep doing what they keep doing. And we need to be brave enough to get the right mm. quality of player in that allows them to sit for not just one game, but two or three games to rediscover their freshness, rediscover their superpowers, which we know they have. Watching Martinelli last night, he should have been playing. Now, Marquinhos um, was was um, sick. We ask ourselves, was, yep. was he ever enough? You know, a debate, you know? And um, so we, for me, it's always about Forward, freshness, intensity, speed, the key dynamics going. I haven't wavered. I never wanted a centre mid extra. I felt we could get away with it. I didn't know Anneli was going to go down, but it is what it is, right? For me, you have to keep the speed and the energy up front. You're as good as your forwards. The moment they drop away, we all lose hope. You know, and when when it says nil or we're just getting one goal to back to where we were mid autumn sorry spring of last year with all the one nils and two one games yeah that eventually we, we ran out of luck right and, and we ended up they ended up going sorry Elliot, the margins end up going against us so that's where i am mate more speed we have to think I, I, about how we use the bench we have to yeah no i agree with you and and like it's not the funny thing is i think the reason i i'm not as focused on the defending in, in a game where we conceded twice is because we knew, we said this in preseason, that this is going to be a team that's going to play higher up the pitch, it's going to press more, and sometimes we're going to get done in behind, right? They're, they're going to get in behind this press, they're going to find the holes, and when you're playing with backup defenders and people shifted all over the place and a keeper who didn't expect to play on the night, like, it can happen. Look, one of their goals shouldn't be conceded because Ramsdale just has an error, right? He comes to punch, he doesn't get it. it it's poor from the keeper. I don't think he was planning to play. It's not an excuse. I'm not saying he <laughs> that gives you a, a right to not come get to it when you when you come out. If he stays in his goal there, he's catching that easy. And then they got one other goal. The reason it doesn't concern me is because we, we knew that we had that vulnerability, but we started to think, well, if we're up the pitch that much, we have the firepower, we have the ability to control games, we're going to get a lot of goals. We started the season doing it, and now it, you know we've gone through a little bit of a cold patch. And to be fair... That can happen, and that will happen. We don't have an Erling Holland, right? We have guys that are learning to be goal scorers, not guys that are preternatural goal scorers. So to move a little bit further back towards our end of the pitch, Tim, then it, it it's tough, right? Because you have to be, be mindful of whether you're leaning into narrative or what you're describing is actually what happened in the game. Because we can... Be critical, for example, of a Sambi Lakanga, but you're like, this is a game that we had 70% possession. So it's like, you know, what was his role? Well, part of that role is to be in the spaces you need to be in to prevent yourself from being caught out. And I think Rob Holding's positioning doesn't help the midfielders because he likes to drop deep. He likes to be, you know, deeper than I think he needs to be in a lot of situations. So let's handle those two as a tandem. There are two players that probably right now are looking at this team and saying, where's my place? Rob Holding would like to be the first man up in set at center back if one's missing, but he's got to get past Tomiyasu. Sambi Lakanga would like to be the first man up when party's missing, and to this point he has been because there's no El Nenny. But he's also trying to figure out, I mean, he's been chirping a lot about wanting to be a starter, not liking the bench. This is the position he was brought in to become a starter for. So for those two, what's your assessment of this night for them and where they are in, in making their claim to have more opportunities. Yeah, I'll, I'll deal with holding first because I think that's the mm -hmm. shorter and easier one. <laughs> uh, you know, I put it, I put it in the in the our WhatsApp chat during the game. Like he, he's in Cedric territory. He can't play this football. He just can't. He's yeah. he's got other qualities as a defender, but his positioning in this game is all over the place. He can't play high up the pitch. When they and and actually to be. 
I say to be fair, because this is an even bigger criticism, they brought De Jong on, and to Clive's point, about changing gears. That changed the gear, that changed the temperature of the game, then bringing yeah, De Jong on. Mm-hmm. And, you know, to support that point as well, put it this way, every game where we've scored the first goal this season, we haven't lost. We've conceded the first goal twice and we've lost both games. So that shows you that we're, we're not quite at the stage where we can change the pattern of a game yet. Um, or turn the tide um, and, and mm-hmm. we've seen that even in games where we've taken points but um, he, he couldn't handle De Jong either <laughs> which is the kind of challenge you'd think he'd be more suited for I don't think Rob Holding's going to be an Arsenal player next season I think that's one of those when when you look at how uh, Jurgen Klopp addressed his kind of rebuild at Liverpool there were like three layers of player there were like the Ben Tekes, the Danny Ingses the Lazar Markovic's the Sackos, he sold them straight away. It was just mm-hmm. like, you cannot play our football. Thanks. See you later. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Then there was like a second layer of player where it was like, I'd like to replace you in the long term, but I can't do it all at once. So like your Adam Lalanas, your Lucas Lavers, they stayed in the team for a year, year and a half, two years. And then it was like, thank you. You could play our football, but you just can't play it to the standard of the guys we're going to bring in thank you, shake hands, see you later, mm-hmm. take your standing ovation from the from the cop next time you come back. And and I think Rob Holding's just in that second layer, that kind mm. of, all right, thanks, you've done a job for us. Um, you know, I'm not just under this manager, but you, you just, you can't go where we're going. No yeah. hard feelings. Go and play for Everton or Crystal Palace or one of those guys. You'll be great. We'll get a transfer fee. Thank you very much. We'll buy another left-footed centre half. I think that's just where it is. The fact that you took Rob Holding off and went to a back three, that tells you a lot. I promise you, if Gabriel and Saliba are starting this game and it's a Premier League game and we're 2-0 down, that's not a change he makes. Hmm, he no. does not take one of those centre halves off and put a forward on. That wasn't just about being attacking. That was about getting Rob Holding off the pitch. Mm. And it didn't necessarily fix things. We did have to go back to a back four. But there's a reason that that's the first lever Arteta pulled. So holding, I'd like to think that once we get Zurich and Brighton out the way, that we don't really have to see him um, very often, um, which sounds like a harsh thing to say. With Sambi, I, I was thinking about this last night. I think of Sambi. Now, I've been banging the drum ever since we've been in the Europa League, and I think we've done this, like play the academy kids you know, play Joe Willock, play Ainsley Maitland-Niles, play Reese Nelson, play Eddie Nketiah, keep those minutes away from players that we want to protect. And one of two things will happen. They'll either be great and we'll give them a new contract, um, you know, notwithstanding the discussion we've had. Thanks, Eddie. You get your new contract. We think you can be our backup striker. Ainsley, we should have sold you two years ago, but there we go. <laughs> Thanks, but sorry, this isn't Joe Willock. Thank you. We've won some Europa League groups. We got through some League Cup rounds without hurting players that we wanted to protect. Not going to work. We'll take our money. And, and I think we've got to put players like Tavares and Lokonga into the same category. So even though we brought them in, we should look at them almost like academy products that we're testing out. Now, Sambi Lokonga, I, I don't think it's going to happen for him at Arsenal. You can see by our behaviour when El Nenny got injured and we spent all of deadline day trying to sign a kid, Jurabchian client, that, like, I'm sorry, that that shows like a fair bit of desperation. Yes. Um, uh, and, and possibly it doesn't justified. Scream, we have faith in Sambi. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, and like, I'm not saying it's unjustified, but, you know, I, I remember the last time we scrabbled on deadline day for a Kia client and it was David Louise. So yeah. that shows you the basket. That shows you where the coach's head was at at that point. Mm-hmm. And to the point that you made on the instant reaction, Elliot, I just don't see a world where he really gets games as a number eight, even if I think he'd be better in that position. I think he's behind too many players. So I don't think it's going to happen for, Sa- for Sambi Lukonga at Arsenal. I don't think he'll be here this time next year. That's not the same as saying it's a bad signing because ultimately... We've got through this Europa League group. Whether we win it remains to be seen. We've got through it. We've protected party. We gave him some games last season when we protected party. It's gone fine. Maybe there's no long-term future in it. We'll flip. We'll get good money because he's still young. He's still highly rated. Not a problem, really. Yeah. But I, I think one of the things, I've, one of the thoughts I've also been having about Sambi recently, um, again, I'm going to, 
well, it's not an analogy because I think it's directly relatable. Uh, Arsenal women brought in um, a, a teenage player called Gio uh, this summer and they immediately mm-hmm. loaned her out to Everton. And I asked the manager about it, about why he did that, even though he thinks the squad's a bit short. And he said she's been playing for the last two years. So she'd gone out on loan for a couple of games and she'd been playing every game at the club she'd been on loan at. And he said, I didn't want to stop her doing that because when you're, you, even though she's 19, she's had two years where she's played every game. And he was yeah. like, I don't want to stop that. I want her to go and play again because when you're a young player and you're used to playing and you stop playing, it's bad for your development. I think that's what's happened to Sambi. I think he was at Andlecht. He was the captain. He was playing every yep. game. And now all of a sudden... He's in and out again, and I think it's just disrupted his rhythm, and he's probably looking at it. I'm sure he'll want to go in the, sh- in the summer. I'm sure Arsenal will shake hands on that. We'll get our money back and some. We'll move on. No problem. Uh, it, it's still, he will still be a good signing. Yeah, and I, I do wonder, Clive, if it's getting to the point where, God forbid, Party had to miss three Premier League games and El Nenny wasn't available. I, I wonder if it's getting to the point where we would try to figure something else out, where if, you know, we'd try to play a a Ben White there. Or so, I, mean, I'm, I mean, and I'm not killing Samby. I'm just saying that in that role, it has not looked like a fit this season. I think when he came in last season, he looked pretty good, but the role was slightly different. There's a lot of responsibility positionally for that role now. And if you aren't where you need to be, the whole thing's a house of cards pretty quickly. I mean, we see, you know, although PSV didn't create a ton in this game, the counterattacks they had were pretty dangerous almost every time. And even against Southampton and someone against Leeds, what I'm starting to see is that teams, I think, are starting to figure out that the space is on the wings, a big switch. When we're sucked over to one side of the pitch, you get it over to the other side, and there's a lot of room down the opposite wing. And so maybe we're being not figured out, but slightly figured out a little bit. And a lot of that responsibility to close down space and nowhere to be falls on the, the player playing central midfield for us right now. And off the ball, I don't know if I see it from Samby. So, you know, I, I've used a Ceballos comp in the past. Some people agree with it. Some people don't. The reason I like it is I think Ceballos was a very talented player with the ball at his feet. But in terms of the pace of his play and his understanding of space, it, it didn't work for what we wanted to be doing. And I see similar tendencies and skill sets from Samby. So do you see this heading to to the kind of place that Tim was talking about, where it, it's going to be a shaking of the hands and a parting of the ways, or maybe a path back for him that we don't see right now? It could well do. Um, where, where should I go with this? Um, I think <laughs> Samby plays in Europa League games, and, and those games are 70% intense compared to the... The Premier League games. And I think he rolls into some of that. I think he he falls into the environment by which he's playing. Uh, he played one league game at Old Trafford. We didn't win it um, from the start. So that's how he hanging around his neck. I think we made a mistake here. And this is a mistake I think we made. I think we should have moved on El Nenny. We should have moved on El Nenny and brought in a 24, 25-year-old. Ready to go. Centre mid. Mm. Because then, what we have, we have somebody 24, 25, who's played in top five leagues, X amount of minutes, you can take your choice, Elliot. And then Sambi becomes the developmental player. He's the one we don't care about so much, because you've got time to develop, mate. Don't worry about it, you can, you can come on, it's nice and easy, you can play eight, you can play six. But we don't mind, because we've got a third guy, mid, in his prime, that can play. So what we did, we took, the, we took a nice guy option. So he kept El Nini, who mm-hmm. never gets injured because he doesn't really get into a sprint. Gets injured, rips his hamstring to pieces. I mean, how did that happen? <laughs> right? I want to know how that happened. Right? So he rips his hamstring to pieces. First time he's he used them. January. <laughs> right? So, um, and suddenly now, the development, developmental player is now in a role where he has to be as good as the best number six in the league, in my opinion. Or at least mitigate, close that gap. 
And it's not possible because no one's as good as him. No one does what he does. No one has the same offensive and defensive responsibility. No other player has that in the league. The closest I've seen was when Calvin Phillips was at Leeds, when he had he was spraying the ball, he's also making the tackles. Rodri hasn't got his responsibility. Fabinho's running around like he's got stiff legs at the moment. He hasn't got the same responsibility. Mm-hmm. At Chelsea, yep. they they play that they double up in there as a two. Other teams double up as a two. You know, there's no one else that puts responsibility on that position like we do, right? So, so we're asking a developmental player to do that role. And by the way, I don't think he was ever meant to do that role this year. He's meant to sh- he's meant to rest Shaka's legs. And in fact, if you, f- I'm giving mm. you another view. You could turn this around and say. The fact Thomas Party Touchwood has not been injured is because Sambi has allowed him to rest and keep his feet up, right? And that's so he's playing out of position. He's almost like a hero role. The two yeah. heroes are Sambi and Shaka, because Shaka just never knocks plays, and Sambi. So they're covering the fact that El Nene's minutes are zero, right? To allow the other guy, mm. who is the guy that makes it all work, to sit on his backside, right? If they, if El Nene yep. was fit. Party Although he came in in this flying. game, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. He wouldn't even be flying. He'd be. Yeah. We got, we have an issue with his late in game um, fitness, in my opinion. Right. So, so the issue is for me is that we are our expectations around Sambi have changed due to his elevation within the squad due to injury to a key cog who should not have been key. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then he should not yeah. have been that, that key in sense. the first place. We should have bought somebody. Then yeah. we all look at Sambi slightly differently. We look at him like like Vieira. We just look at him and say, "Oh, he had a good game. We had a bad game. We're not worried. He can play. He plays our football. No one's worried because we've got Odegaard, right? Because he's well, top. He's peak, and it's not a problem. This is the issue. The gap by which we're asking this kid to fill is too great, and I think it's wearing on him. And uh, and I, you know, generally, if if you want to talk about style, I'm not quite sure the style's there. But I want to give him a little bit more time in my head, you know, and I think it's up to us to mm. make sure there's That's another fair. player in there to allow him time to develop, in my opinion. No, I, I like, this isn't, it's funny because I think Sammy is a talented player. I'm not totally sure what he is. You know, like for a, a lot of years, I wasn't totally sure what Shaka was, right? It turns out he's a world class eight. Who knew? <laughs> but like, I'm not totally sure what Sambi is, but if you're telling me he's an eight, I'm telling you I don't know that there's a clear path for him there. If you're telling me he's a six, I'm saying I don't see it yet. And he wants to play. So we're at, we're at odds with the fact that he, this is not a guy who's like, hey, if it's two more seasons before I arrive, I'm willing to do that. Yeah, Clive? Just want to come back. I think this this eight six six eight. I think it's going to mold into one, and you just build your attributes. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not too concerned. When Thomas Party came... I didn't, hear, I didn't hear anybody saying he was a lone six. I didn't hear anybody say that, right? Um, Shaka's become an attacking eight. He's been a six before. He's been a double six. I think you just need to be able mm-hmm. to build your game. Even Douglas Louise is a, a six or an eight, and the Villa fans argue which one he is, you know? And um, mm. so I think you just need to be a six or an eight and be good at it. I just think the responsibility we put upon him is great. People, when you, when you say a couple of things, I do disagree with what you said there earlier about we bought him as part of his replacement. I don't think we did. I think we just bought another midfielder as a really? six or an eight. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, mm. and we, and he wasn't sure what he was. I listened to the interviews when he, when he came, he wasn't sure what he was. And also a lot of the, co- a lot of the comments attributed to him are being related to Belgium. And he felt he, he, he was upset about not being in their squad. He thought about moving, and his decision was, I prefer 20 minutes at Arsenal for my development rather than playing a game everywhere else where I'm going to win 3-0 and learn nothing. You know what I mean? And, uh, and he took yeah, that fair. choice. Mm-hmm. And so, and we've taken, we, what we've done, we put that comment, a little bit chippy, and then put the little chippy moment in the All or Nothing documentary and said, mate, I'm not sure about you. You, you, you can't sit on the bench. You've got a bad attitude. I think we need to be fair. That's we get really little snippets yeah. of um, information, and we don't quite know the full story. Hey, mate, he's a jogger for me, and I don't like what I see. However, that can be fixed to so get moving. And I actually thought he was better in this game than he was in previous games until the guy ran off his shoulder and they scored. Right? So there you go. And, and to be fair, the dumb thing about 
not the dumb thing, but the the thing that can lead you astray trying to interpret a couple of comments here and a couple of comments there in a scene from All or Nothing is, what do we know about Mikel? Mikel does not tolerate personalities that aren't on the boat, that aren't fully committed, that don't you know accept their role in the team, that don't work hard to be in it. Like, if there was a legitimate feeling that Samby was a malcontent, I think somebody else would be playing these Europa League games. <laughs> because Mikel is not afraid, as we know, to say you're not in the group unless you're all the way in the group. So maybe cool our jets on over analyzing some of his comments. The thing I will say too, is look, we made two signings this summer. Forget Marquinhos, forget Vieira. We made two signings. If we didn't sign Vieira this summer, our season's no different in my view. If we didn't sign Marquinhos this season, our season, our season no different in, in my view. We signed Gabriel Jesus. We signed Alexander Zinchenko and we are missing the latter. I think at this point, well said. Well said. the way that left back position plays is not for everybody. Don't tell me Tierney knows how to play it. Tierney's a lovely player. He does not know how to play it that way. Tomiyasu does not know how to play it that way. They can learn it, and they could do okay at it, but it's not natural, right? It's not like a, a, a duck to water. And, and for Zinchenko, it's a duck to Zin water, and we saw it earlier in the season. Yep. Mm -hmm. I just want to say, don't forget, we were debating when we signed Zinchenko, was he a left back or were we going to use him in midfield? And what are we talking about? Yes, midfield. exactly. Do you see what I mean? And so it's huge misses I, I, these I players. I totally we've agree. Lost. Yep. We've huge misses. Sorry, mate. Go ahead. No, no, no. It's that other player in those positions in midfield that can control the ball and progress it and create openings. And he really was the double pivot type player when he was playing, in a sense. We've missed that. It, it's taxing the lone six now more. Thomas Party, because he can do some incredible things, is handling it. Maybe Samby can't handle it as well, which is to be understood. You know, the thing about positional football, he says, not knowing much about positional football, is that it is a collective. It is not hero ball. It is not hit it long to Kane, have him knock it down to Sun. It is a collective. And if you take out a piece of the collective, everything is impacted by it. And especially if it's a position that's very complex in its application. Cancelo is one of the most important players for City. And in the same way, Zinchenko might kind of be for us. And it just so happens that we bought a fullback to be our new left back to replace our often crocked left back. And it turns out the guy we got is even more crocked than the often, often crocked guy. So uh, all crocks all the time. Kind of like, uh, you know, a, a middle-aged dad walking around the mall. Crocs all the time. Just crocs. Nothing but crocs. Okay. Um, let's talk about our sponsor, BetterHelp. We want to talk about uh, thinking about mental health more like solutions, problem solving, rather than crisis management. When it's crisis time, of course, you need that help. But sometimes staying out of that crisis mode or sometimes just being more effective is, is to be in problem solving mode when faced with a challenge in life. Learning how to find your own solutions, empowering yourself to get through those problems before they become you know, uh, monumental. I use therapy. I'm sure everybody's sick and tired of hearing it by now, but it really was so impactful for me, and it wasn't in a moment of crisis. It was just a moment of self-doubt and challenges. Um, you know, Clive disagreed with me one day, and it was straight to therapy, you know? And now now I've, I've, I've found the framework for dealing with that. Uh, but, yeah, I, I think what makes BetterHelp special, a lot of things. Firstly, you can get matched with someone in 48 hours. You can switch therapists. If it's not working out, you can go camera on, camera off. So it can be totally anonymous if you want. It's convenient. It's affordable. It's accessible. It's entirely online. There's even specialists. So maybe you, you really want help with a specific area. And in your geographic area, there isn't someone who's trained in that. With better help, you can get paired with someone who's a fit for you, for your needs. You can get into problem-solving mode. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash vision today to get 10% off your first month. That's better, H-E-L-P, betterhelp.com slash vision. 10% off your first month. Do it now. Clive, is that enough of that? Indeed. Nailed it. Okay, Tim. Um, yes. Yes. Any, any issues with chasing the game in the way we did in the sense of, of bringing on more starters, getting stronger. I mean, we have sort of shared these games, so it may have been the plan anyway. It does seem like some people get an hour and some people get a half hour, and he just kind of shares it that way. And so if you got the hour last week, you get the half hour this week. Not exactly what we've done, but we've done some of that. I don't know 
that you need to bring a Ben White on who's looked shattered the last couple of weekends. I don't know that you need to bring a Gabriel Magalhaes on who limped down the tunnel after the game. Um, not that we know anything's wrong, by the way, but the pitch, you know, again, to Clive's point, was like pudding, uh, which is delicious. Uh, but that that's beside the point. Sorry, now I'm thinking of pudding. Um, a- any issue with with the, the decision to go even stronger with the subs and, and sort of chase the game, w- would you have preferred to see him sort of say, these players are going to solve it or they're not, and I'm just keeping my powder dry for the weekend? No, I've got, I've got no issue. I, I think you've kind of got to, really. I, I don't think you can you can throw in the towel on it. Um, and I think we'd have complained quite bitterly, really, <laughs> if, hmm. if, if that had happened. I think with regards to bringing on like Ben White and Gabriel, I think... Clearly, what happened was he took holding off when the second goal went in because it was like fucking hell. This guy wasn't doing it in the first half, and now they've brought a striker on and he can't handle him. Let's just go to a back three, and that really didn't work. And I think sometimes, well, not sometimes. I think often the way managers will think about this as well is actually if you have, particularly in your kind of defensive and midfield units, if you have familiarity, you do less running basically, because I think what happened when we went to the back three and even when holding was on, Saliba's playing two centre-back positions and we're running him all over the place and every time PSV transition, it's like two on two and Saliba's, like, his head must be spinning um, by this point. So I think a lot of that was like, right, let's stop that happening. Let's put the stabilisers on at the back so that we're not sprinting around like headless chickens and let's get some control over this game. And I think when you have guys that help you have control over the game, you probably exert a little bit less physically anyway. I think what you do when you've got chaos in one area of your team is that just has a knock on and then everyone's sprinting everywhere. It's like a fire in the house. Everyone's like jumping out the window, screaming, sprinting, gathering up their loved ones and their most treasured possessions I think just wanted to take that little bit of chaos out but also obviously not just that it was obviously about trying to go and get a point and it was weird because I kept looking up at the screen and you know we'd been we deserved to be 2-0 down like no two ways about it that was Mm -hmm. a 2-0 game and I found myself looking at the the clock and being like it's only 72 minutes like (laughs) Yeah, we we I don't we we only have to put it together for fifteen minutes in this game to get the point we need. Now we didn't do that. Don't get me wrong. And so yeah, in hindsight, <laughs> don't bring any of those guys on. Bring on the youngest guys on the bench. And if we lose three nil, we lose three nil. But I, I don't I don't think the result was off the table at that point. I do think it was justified to think we could get two goals here. They they've expended a lot of energy. Let's get the control back. We've got, like, Saka on. We've got Jesus on. We can score two goals against these. Not, you know, not easily, but it can be done. So I, I don't really have an issue. And, and also the reward, had we managed that, for, a fa- for, I think, a fairly small amount of risk, like 25 minutes of some of those guys, the reward would have been next week is completely off. Mm. Like, you know, next week is... Not even a training drill. Next week is flip-flops and sunglasses, um, even though it's November. Uh, <laughs> although it's very mild uh, at the moment for... for so for maybe shoes and sunglasses. But yeah, not yeah, yeah. A, a light jacket, um, okay. all that's needed at the moment. But yeah, <laughs> I, I don't have any issue with that at all, no. Yeah, that that's fair. I Like, it's funny. Once upon a time, I really would have gotten stuck into a debate about rotation. Um, I just don't have the same frustration about it because I think we've managed it relatively cleverly. I think players are getting an hour on a Thursday at half speed on a day. They would have trained anyway. I I get that you could pick up an injury, but people haven't. I don't know that I buy the fatigue argument. Do I really think the hour they're playing against a PSV on a Thursday versus the training they would have been in was that much more exertion? Like, I'm not sure I believe that. And that leads me to a question, Clive. Where do we need to improve? What do we need to see this weekend? Because i got to be honest with you, and I think Tim has made this point, and I, I think I'm somewhat in agreement with it. I think the fatigue issue is overplayed. I think basically we're playing two games a week. We haven't been great the last couple of weeks, especially in second halves. And so correlation equals causation must be fatigue. I think there are things we're just not doing well. Like, the Southampton game should have been over. We should have taken advantage of the period they played 4-4-2. It was a mistake by Hassan Huddle. We didn't finish our chances. They switched 
tactically, and we struggled to regain our foothold in the game. Like, it still didn't create much, by the way. You know, we just, we didn't, we didn't create what we needed to. I'm not as sold on the idea that this is fatigue. I think we've gotten some basic things wrong, and I'm curious what you think, if you see a few aspects of our play that have suffered and what we need to see improve this weekend to make sure that this game that Tim is terrified of goes as easily as I think it will go. I agree, Tim. I don't think it's going to be easy. Um, not uh, a great time to morning. play Forest, but hey, look, we're at home. It'll be a nice, hopefully nice, mild, sunny day. And the ground Four the ground will take us over the, uh, over the line, right? So fatigue, loss of form. It just happens, right? The rhythm of a football season. No one can play brilliant every single week, right? That's why I have player ratings. <laughs> player ratings, they change. That's a good right? point. I'm, I'm sure, um, Elliot, I'm sure if you were to look at our PPDA, for example, pressing and how many, t- how many times people are having more touches against us in second halves and things like that, I'm sure, I'm sure that's going up. There are information, data information, what happens when you're a little bit tired is you can serve yourself and maybe you don't press from the front. And they are getting a few more transitions on us, right? So it's just humans. Humans that are, they can still play. They're not injured. But they're just playing the month, playing the season, right? It's just, it's just where we are, you know? I don't see it as a, a problem. I think acceptance is the key thing. I think having some foresight, this is going to happen. I'm making sure, as I said earlier, that you can, you can change your way out of it, right? Uh, another, you know, another. I think I learned this back in the Fergie days. Actually, remember when, when they won the treble, they used to have York and Cole, and then once you saw York and Cole off, they bring on Solskjaer and Sheringham, and you had to beat them twice. And having that fear that you never had them beat, it really, it really enveloped itself over the rest of the league. And I look at us right now, and at the moment mm. in time, everyone knows that Gabriel Jesus has lifted our levels. So what happens when he drops his level? We drop. Yeah. Right? So, so what are we going yeah. to do when we replace him? Right? So we, are we going to replace him with a big centre forward? Are we going, are we going to ha- I want to get to a point where teams have got to beat us twice. They can't see off the first crew. The second crew comes on. Right? So, and I do think... Fatigue, freshness, form, it's a natural thing, and that's why you have a squad. It's as simple as that. The squad is stretched. Uh, We've loaned out our best academy kids, which is the right thing to do, the ones that are close to the physical level. The ones that are here are bright and promising, but they're young in body and mind. So we can't call on a lot of them. And so we are relying on the people behind, and a few of them are injured, and a few of them are uh, not carrying the burden, as we would expect. And maybe that's very unfair on them, but that's how I feel. Right? So, so yeah, fatigue may, it is a factor. It really is. We're trying to manage it. What we've done with this World Cup, it's ridiculous, really. I always remember mm. thinking, oh, if we ever win a World Cup, you know, all our English players should be nice and fresh. They should get there in mid-season rather than being tired at the end of the season. Well, actually, it's gone the other way. All we've done is squeeze more games in give them no prep time before the World Cup. And half these England players and half these players are going to be tippy-toeing around the tulips, trying not to get kicked. Because even a slight kick on the ankle, two, three weeker, you're in trouble. You're done. Hamstring, grade yeah. one hamstring is three weeks. Do you think people are going to be sprinting around in a week or so's time? Don't think these results are going to stay as they are. We have these predictions in our mind. I can see a lot of surprises coming from teams that with players who have got nothing to lose, who are going to be throwing themselves into people, and some people who've got a career moment to lose are going to be jumping out of the way of stuff. And that's, again, it's human. So the one, one thing we need to do, Elliot, is be ultra-efficient. And what annoyed me about the Southampton game was we were so good. And when we were good, we didn't care enough to kill them. We need to kill these teams when we're good, knowing that the rhythm of the game is likely to change in the most compressed fixture month since, I think I read it as 1980. I think maybe I might, I might have got it wrong, mm. Tim will tell me. The most, we haven't played this many games for a long time, right? I left school in 1980. Yeah. <laughs> That's a long time ago. And so basically, this is something we just have to try to manage, man. I think it's real. 
the, the fatigue and the fixer thing is real. And you put a World Cup on the end, this yeah. is real. It's not to be dismissed. No, I, I think that's fair. And look, we have to remember we have the youngest team in the Premier League. Tim, one of the things that I not worry about but wonder about is the mindset and whether they let the pressure get to them or let the situation get to them. Like, I really think against Newcastle away last season, look, we didn't have the players. But I think you saw a beaten Arsenal step on that pitch. You know, Ramsdale's kicking long. The ball's coming straight back. To, and I, I get it. You got an El Nenny instead of a party, and you've got a this instead of a that, and you got this guy instead of that guy. And, uh, fine. But, you know, I do wonder if a young team doing so much better than anyone had expected, and, and then you start to see what happens when that kind of pressure and that kind of attention is on you at 21 and 22 and 20 and 19, you know, these, these kind of ages. A couple of uncharacteristic mistakes from Saliba, a couple finishes that could be better from, you know, a, a Martinelli or a Jesus, in fact. It seemed like PSV were in our head in this game. We were pretty wound up by them. Obviously, it was a contentious game against Southampton. I think the referee is more to blame than our mentality. But do you think that the psychology of this plays a role and that it is going to be a little bit more of a roller coaster season than we might like it to be because young players are really going to get wrapped up in the moment. They're going to get wrapped up in the emotion of an individual game or the pressure of their position. I mean, I know they're professionals, but they haven't been in these wars before. And they're going to go through some things psychologically. Do you think that that we maybe haven't factored in the price of being so young psychologically, trying to manage being top of the table in the Premier League at this point in the season, yeah. you know? Yeah, of course, of course. And look, we've we've been here before in like 2007, eight. We were top of the league right through till March, and you know we we saw what happened there. Albeit <laughs> the player that exploded the most was probably the most experienced and the captain. But um, yeah. but yeah, yeah. We and and like I don't think anyone, Arsenal fans, certainly not pundits or anything like that, really thought that we were in the title race. And that's not just because. I mean, to be fair, it's mainly because just Man. you look at Man City and Erling Haaland and think, well, how do you get past that? And that's not without justification. But I do also think that most Arsenal fans were like, we're not really sure that second in the Premier League is our level. Um, it probably isn't. I, I was certainly looking at it much more as, let's get as big a buffer as we can <laughs> to, the, to yeah. the guys that to I think place, are chasing yeah. <laughs> like third to sixth. Um, but you're right. They're, like we absolutely have to take into account how does the team potentially respond to falling back into the pack a bit if that's what happens because that's not that's not certain yet. We are still top of the league. Um, but you know, if we have like a couple of dodgy results, we've got three league games until the World Cup. If they don't go that well, then then yeah, there is a psychological challenge there to the team. I do think at that point the break would. As much as it would feel bad, like if we don't, let's say we pick up like a couple of draws at Chelsea and Wolves and we go in like that and City have overtaken us, it, it would feel a bit bad. But for the players, it would probably be a good time to have a break, you know, and have a couple of weeks off, go away with your family for those that can. Uh, others will mentally reset for a completely different challenge. Mm. Um, and then, you know, some other guys, a, a lot of our guys are going to be in Dubai in early December, because even the ones that are going to the World Cup, some of them will come back pretty quickly. Um, yeah. You know, I, I don't think Ghana are going to the final. I don't think Japan are going to the final. I stand mm. to be shot down <laughs> there. <laughs> uh, Ghana have gone to a semi-final um, in 2010, but, you know, I, I think, may, I, I don't even think England are going that far this time, um, personally. I, I think our Brazilians are the are the ones who've got the most potential to be there for the long haul. So you're saying Matt Turner won't be back till after the final? <laughs> is what you're telling? Me. Yeah, 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 yeah. But we're, <laughs> we'll be we'll be able to, you know, he'll come back with his medal and and <laughs> yeah. everything will be fine. But yeah, so I do I, think I won't be fine because I will be drunk for a long, <laughs> long, long time, <laughs> and the rest of the world will be going, "Oh my God, we've let them win!" The yeah, no, you don't world let us cup. don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> then we actually but, can say world champions for something <laughs> for, for once. <laughs> um, but but yeah, so I do think that a lot of like 
90% of our squad are going to be in Dubai together at the beginning of December, and that will mm. have a value. We've seen, I think, a couple of seasons where that's had like a good value to us as well. It, it feels a bit... I think you're quite right to reference the end of last season, not just from an experience standpoint. I don't know about you, I've still got... And I expected to have this just because of the schedule, but I've got that, let's just get over the line here. Let's just get to mm-hmm. the World Cup you know, in as, as good yep. nick as possible. And then that's the break in the season and we go again after that. So it's, it's not quite the same. There isn't quite the same pressure. Obviously, a lot of these players have that experience from last season and I do believe that will stand them in good stead. It's like that old saying about um, good judgment comes from experience, experience comes from bad judgment. And like, so a lot of these players are further along on that and therefore have gone through that. And I do think that has a value as well. But, but yeah, like, look, I was always expecting, and we will not be the only club specific podcast having this conversation <laughs> at the moment, like particularly all the clubs in Europe, maybe other than City, who actually don't have a massive squad, but what they have is they have 22 players and they can all start. We've got yeah. 16 players and you trust them to start and maybe four or five you think, oh, there's a bit of a drop off there. Like, you, you know, the Man United Vision podcast, the Chelsea mm. Vision podcast, they're all having this conversation at the moment. So I, I don't think it's in the words of Tom Jones, it's not unusual. It's not unusual. I agree. And Clive, as a final point, I look, we've got three games left that matter before this break, win two of them, and we're going to be in a good position. The Zurich game, I guess, technically matters, but we're going to win that game. Um, This weekend, I'd love to see a couple of things happen. I'd love to see the left flank come back to life. I think the thing that's happened with Zinchenko being out is also that we've struggled to get the left side of the attack as connected and as effective as it had been. Um, And I I think some of that has been the rotating, the revolving door at left back and and not necessarily getting the same kinds of build-up from that area. But I, I also think if I had to pick anything to happen this weekend, it would be a hat trick for Gabriel Jesus. I'd like to see him, you know, back on the score sheet, feeling good about his football, finishing those chances. We don't want this. Does Gabriel Jesus have a finishing problem narrative to go from being a narrative to being a real issue uh, for him, for us? If you could pick the things that you'd like to see happen apart from the three points on Sunday, what are the things that would – and I'm not saying we're all worried – to a big level, but whatever worries we have right now, what would ease them for you if they happened on Sunday? Uh, I want to see, I just want to see us score a few goals. That'd be the nicest thing. Um, (laughs) I think goals hide, uh, hide a lot of sins, shall we say. And, um, but I I just want to remind us that we've only lost one game (laughs) in the league. And even (laughs) in that game, Mm -hmm. We should have won it, in my opinion. If the first goal was allowed, we would have won it. Um, oh, we definitely been... should have won that. We should have lost yeah. the Leeds game. <laughs> Leeds game was, was the one that we showed frailties, and we, we won that game really, really well, so we got a plus out of it. I know people are worried about... Elliot, you always go straight to attack, and, and I'm a bit more of a pragmatist, and I, I, and I think about goals against and how they affect us. Look what happened yesterday. We make a defensive mistake. Rob Holding goes running past somebody when he needs, just needs to stand still, put his hand in his back, either gone backwards. But he just let it roll him, and we're conceding, and it goes into the top of our net. And then a goalkeeper comes flying out like Superman, and we basically concede two goals, and our day is changed. And oh, you're worried about our left flank. Yeah. And I just remember watching the Liverpool game thinking, wow, our left flank was pretty solid. We're keeping one of the best teams in the world out of our net. More than more than we than we ever have done, shall we say? We haven't even scored yeah. against them for years. We've managed to beat them, and 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 it was our defensive solidity and physicality that won us that game, that allowed our front end players to do what they needed to do, how we create transitions, etc. So different ways to skin a cat, um, different ways to approach a game. On the ideal day, we'd have everyone pushing the opposition half. We'd have a, a left back inverted, a right back inverted, but then flip him around the outside when he needs to. Thomas Party with forty yards of space all around him, controlling it and not having a limp in the last ten minutes of a game. And our forwards being super sprinting, super agile, and only guards back spinning passes to them. That's the that's the ideal, but that's not a football season. A football season is the Leeds game. And the football season is how we react to PSV with a short turnaround. 
I'm looking at the Zurich game. And I've just seen the Chelsea game is 12 o'clock noon. I mean, are they just are they just taking the mickey here, right? So 12 o'clock noon kickoff, I mean, away at Chelsea. So these are the things that, these are the challenges we have to overcome, right? And it needs a group to do that. Mm. If I'm the major, I think his words are perfect. We need a reset. Sit everybody down, throw away the last couple of weeks and say, right, we're back to where we were. Let's get back to our levels, back to our intensity, back to our fundamentals. Let's focus on our details when receiving the ball, keeping the ball and pushing people backwards, pass forwards, pass into the interior, even though it's risky, stop passing backwards. You're allowing people to creep onto us. Let's get back to what we were, being brave on the ball, being very brave. And, and these teams will fold away. They will fold away. We have the talent now and it's fit. So they will fold yep. away. Let's get back to our intentions to play positively and I think we'll be fine. Can yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, please. Can mm-hmm. I just add to that as well? Uh, just a, a, a thought. Um, I, I've had many times over the last 18 months or so, actually, like Arteta's had the opportunity to make some excuses in the last couple of games that haven't gone well against Southampton. At this game, he could have blamed the pit or had a go at the yeah. pitch. He could have had a go at the ref Southampton. Compl- like not just hasn't done it, has refused to do it. And like you can see, he's really trying to build not just accountability, but also like focus on per the title of our last podcast focus on the things you can control i think that's absolutely been his focus and rightly so yeah i I think that's well said and yeah again southampton he said no complaints in this game he said we didn't compete i think those are accurate assessments you know in in the southampton game he said we didn't do the simple things i think that's totally true one of them is put the ball in the back of the net which is not so simple to be fair in this one we didn't compete i agree we lost this one in the duels and ultimately though you finish your chances, these games look different. You finish the chances against Southampton and against PSV. That we created with our football, with our dominance, and both of these games are fine. And we're not worried about the little ricks at the back. So for me, this weekend is still about go get some goals. Fill up your boots. And I know, again, Tim thinks Forrest are one of the three or four best teams in the league, and that's that's fair. He might be right. I, I think we got to go smash them. I think we do. No offense, Tim. I mean, they, they may be third best, but we're first or second best, so we, we still have to smash them. I would say, let's leave it there. Uh, we'll have an instant reaction after that game. We didn't get to a rewatch of the Southampton game this week, which some will say was merciful, but we'll certainly be rewatching both halves of the scoreline I'm about to say in a moment. Tim's on Twitter, at Stoberto. Thank you, Tim. My pleasure, as always. He's also going to be doing the rounds on the Forest Vision podcast, obviously. And Clive, you can find him on Twitter, at Clive PFC. Thanks, Clive. Thank you very much. My name is Elliot Smith. You can me on Twitter at Yankee Gunner. Thanks so much for being here. I hope we didn't worry you too much. Should we worry? I don't think we need to worry, especially not after we love you. And we will talk to you after Arsenal 10 for us now.